Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks again so, so much for joining me. Now in this episode or video, what we're going to be looking at is non-experimental methods. Now this leads directly on from our last videos on experimental methods. And this, just by the sounds of it, should be pretty self-explanatory. Now I'm going to have to set this video up into two parts simply because there's too much for me to discuss in one video. So in this one we're going to be looking at surveys and interviews. In the next one we'll have a look at the other forms of non-experimental methods, that is case study and observation. So without much further ado, let's dive straight in. Now we spent the last video really talking about experiments and how good they were and about how this is the only way we can establish cause and effect in psychology. So they sound pretty good. However, we have to ask ourselves this question here. When do we not want an experiment? Well, the thing about experiments, yes, they're very interesting, but sometimes because we're dealing with human beings, sometimes they're going to be impractical. Sometimes they're going to be purely unethical. Or sometimes it might just be flat out impossible to do. Let's take, for example, a current issue that's really in vogue just now in psychology. That is the effect of stress on child mental health. It's a really interesting area, particularly in adolescence, people like yourselves, teenagers, coping with exam stress and the effect that has on their psychological health. But think about that. If we wanted to do an experiment, then we would have to take a child and give it stress to the point that it impacted on their mental health. That is clearly an absolute no-no. We cannot muck about with someone's health like that. So therefore, for something like that and a whole host of other types of issues and things we'd be interested in, it's really helpful to have the option of non-experimental methods. Now, there are four of these and they differ depending on what we're looking for at any one time. They are surveys, interviews, case studies and observations. Now, we're going to be looking at the first two in this video, surveys and interviews, and we'll save the other two for a future video. Let's talk about surveys and interviews as a whole, first of all. Realistically, they're pretty much the same thing. Both of them are really about asking questions. Now, obviously, they differ in terms of how you ask those questions. So a survey, for example, you guys will have probably done a survey at some point in your life. I'd be very surprised if you hadn't. We might even call this a questionnaire. It's a list of questions that you are handed or given in some way and you fill them out and then you hand them back to the person. That's nice and simple. An interview, again, I'd be very, very uh, interested to see if any of you have had an interview before. You definitely will have at some point in your life when you're applying for jobs. Interviews, again, all about asking questions, but this time face to face. Otherwise, these two methods are pretty much the same thing. They're all about asking questions to people and getting that data back again. Now, the first thing we have to do for both surveys and interviews is we have to actually write the questions themselves. This is more difficult than it would seem. A good interview or a good survey question takes a long time for us to put together. Carefully consider them, we write them out in advance, we certainly don't come up with them on the spot. That would give us some very, very poor questions. Now, the reason this is so difficult to do is there's actually a lot of pitfalls that we could fall into here. I'll give you a couple of these. There are others, but these are the main ones. The first one is something called a leading question. There's an example I've given you there. Was the vote for Brexit a complete disaster? Now, a leading question is a type of question that leads, clues in the name, it leads participants to pick a particular response. Now, the way that it does this is it normally uses strongly emotional language or it's phrased in such a way as to give you one answer that the interviewer is looking for. So look at that question there. Was the vote for Brexit a complete disaster? Well, that implies that it was a complete disaster. Now, I don't really care about your politics. I'm sure everybody has an opinion on this. You wouldn't be human if you didn't. But that is a poor, poor question. What we might say instead is something like, what's your opinion on the vote for Brexit? much more neutral, much more open. Another pitfall for us to avoid is a loaded question. Now, a loaded question includes an assumption. It tells us something about either the researcher or it tells us something about the participant themselves. Now, this is normally done not so much in the way that it's worded, but the way that it's said. Have a look at that question there. 
You don't think that, do you? Well, that implies that whatever that is, is somehow bad or negative or whatever else it might be. It implies something. There's some kind of assumption in the question there. Do you think that all immigrants should be prevented from claiming housing benefit? There's an assumption in there that somehow immigrants are wrong or negative or whatever else it might be. That's a poor question. A better question might be, do we think that any immigrants should be prevented from claiming housing benefit? Not all immigrants, but any immigrants. The last thing for us to focus on here is jargon. Now, jargon's a really kind of complex word. What it really means here is any kind of language that is technical or something that a participant might find difficult to understand. There's an example there. Do you find re revising rather difficult when you are not in a state of cognitive flow? Well, that's a difficult question, right? Because we have to know what cognitive flow is first. Are some age laws of this country problematic? Well, what is an age law? The participant might not know. So we have to avoid jargon, phrase it in kind of simple English, make sure that everyone understands. Other things we have to consider for writing questions are what type of questions to go for. Now these fall into two rough categories, open and closed. Now an open question is a very neutral, open-ended question and it allows the respondent to use their own words in response. So there's an example. What can you tell me about Scotland? It's up to the participant to fill in the blanks there. They will tell you what they want to know, or rather what they know about Scotland. You haven't led them into anything. They're just responding based on their own merit. The opposite of that is a closed question. That normally only has one, maybe two answers, or somehow it's a little bit more locked down. This one is sometimes regarded as being the more negative of the two, sometimes a closed question is regarded as being worse than an open question. Well, that's not true. A closed question has a place and it has a time as well. But psychologists, for lots of reasons, prefer open questions. The last thing we have to consider in here is something called bias. Now, even if our questions are carefully worded, there's the possibility that the data that we gather is going to be biased in some way. Now, we're dealing with humans here, we're dealing with human participants, and they will change their answers depending on lots of factors. Two of the main things that we have to consider here are as follows. One of these is something called acquiescence bias. This is something kind of quirky about human nature, in that participants, humans in general, prefer to say yes than they do to say no. Sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But for example, if you were asked, do you have a good memory? You'd probably say yes. People generally like to agree with you. But if I also asked you the same, a different question, are you always forgetting things? Then you would also probably answer yes. Even those two questions are contradictory to one another. Particip participants rather like to say yes, so therefore, we have to have a balance of both positive and negative questions on the same issue, just to make sure that we can get around acquiescence bias. The other type of bias that I'll tell you about is social desirability bias. Participants distort the truth in order to make themselves look good. Now, this is just human nature, sadly. People like to impress other people. Why else do people buy flash cars and designer clothing? They like to be impressive. If I was to ask you, how many units of alcohol do you drink per week? You are probably going to undercut the actual answer. How many cigarettes have you smoked in your lifetime? How much exercise do you do? You will answer to make yourselves look good, even if that answer isn't true. So therefore, we have to be really careful with social desirability bias. So long as we recognise that that happens, that's normally enough. OK, let's say we've constructed our survey. We've got a good mixture of open and closed-ended questions. We've avoided leading, loaded questions and jargon. What do we do next? Well, if it's a survey that we've got, we have to distribute it. Now, in the past, this was normally done with one way, and that was by post. This is a little bit more old fashioned now. You do sometimes still get surveys through the post, but it's gradually becoming less and less common. Nowadays, much more common to have a survey delivered via email. It's also quite common to have it delivered via social media, Twitter or Facebook, whatever it might be. 
And there's also even dedicated online survey tools. SurveyMonkey, for example, is a really, really good one. We really like SurveyMonkey because it gives you fast data really, really quickly. Let's evaluate surveys for a second, guys. Looks pretty good as a non-experimental method, but there's a couple of things we have to say about it. Strengths, first of all, quick and easy to answer. Participants will generally fire through a survey, particularly if there's a limited amount of questions, very, very quickly, and they find it quite easy to do as well. In this way, the psychologist can gather a huge amount of data. Another strength of this is that answers can be analysed easily. Sometimes answers can even be analysed by computer. We don't have to sit there and pour through every single answer. We get the computer to do it for us. Nice and simple. Negatives, however, is that a survey doesn't really allow our participants to express their opinions. They're only really given a fixed list of questions and a fixed list, fixed rather, list of answers. Well, does that tell us anything about that human at all? Probably not. It tells us about the survey itself, but not the kind of deeper human interest that they have. It doesn't allow participants to ask for further explanation either. Let's say, for example, there's a question, they're puzzling over it, they're not 100% sure what it means or how it's worded. Well, they can't get in touch with you. They can't really ask you, can you clarify that and put it in different language? No, either they have to skip it or they have to answer it untruthfully. We're not really sure about that one. And the last one, and probably the most difficult part about using surveys, is you get an extremely low response rate. Normally, 99% of people, they see a survey turn up in their email inbox or in their Facebook, and they just delete it straight away. They just simply can't be bothered. Even if it's a five or a 10 minute survey, people have too much, uh, too much to do, too little time on their hands. They tend not to do it. If you do get any surveys back at all, Count yourself lucky because it's a difficult one to do. A little bit more to say about interviews here. There's a couple of different types of interview that we can do. But just remember, otherwise, this is pretty much the same thing. We still have to construct our questions. We still have to make sure that we're avoiding all the pitfalls. So what type of interview are we going to go for? Each one of these is face to face. Of course it is. But there's lots of different types we can do. Three of them I'll tell you about. Here's one, a structured interview. Structured interview uses a fixed list of questions and carefully planned as we've already described. It's pretty much similar to a survey except that it's face to face. The interviewer doesn't go beyond those questions. They will only ask the questions that's on their sheet, except of course to make clarifications as and when necessary. Now a structured interview mainly uses closed questions, but they're pretty useful if I've got a large number of participants to do and we don't have a lot of time on our hands, so it can be quite useful. Opposite of a structured interview is an unstructured interview. This one does not stick to a fixed list of questions and it allows the interviewer to vary the questioning depending on what our participant says. It's pretty much like a natural conversation. We have a chat about an issue and they will write down whatever it is that you're saying. Normally we use open questions in this one and it gives us rich detailed data, really, really useful. The last kind I'll tell you about is something called a semi-structured interview. Now this is kind of similar to a structured interview in that there is a list of fixed questions for sure, but in this case, the interviewer can, and pretty much does, deviate when they want to. Let's say they've asked you a question, you respond, but they found that quite interesting what you've just said. So they'll say, okay, that's interesting. Let's explore that a little bit more. Here's another question about that particular thing gives you that little bit more flexibility and that little bit more data if and when you need it. Let's evaluate interviews just very quickly here. There we go, it's moving forward. One strength of using interviews as a method is that it allows for explanation. If the participant doesn't understand the question or wants it reworded or clarified, well, we can do that. So that's a really good use of our time, much better than using a survey. Another strength is that if we use the unstructured interview type, that is personalised to each participant. It gives us the truest form of their um, interpretation. It gives us the truest behaviour, if you like, that that human actually has. Rich, really detailed data, absolutely brilliant. However, in negatives, we obviously get social desirability bias. We can't avoid that. People always do that, and it's always an issue if we're asking them questions. And the last thing 
is that unstructured interviews are costly and time consuming. Imagine how much time and energy it takes to do, let's even say five or six interviews. Let's imagine we've got 600 people to get through, especially if it's an unstructured interview. It's going to take forever and it's going to cost a huge amount of time. As well as that, if we're only using open questions, then that is going to be 600 individual answers that we have to go through. We can't let the computer do it because it's going to be personalised to them. So we have to pour over each answer individually. Incredibly difficult, incredibly time consuming, makes it very, very difficult to use effectively. Key concepts for this one then, guys, we've looked at two different types of non-experimental methods, survey and interview. We've talked about leading and loaded questions. We've talked about jargon as well. We've talked about the two different types of biases, that's acquiescence bias and social desirability bias. And then lastly, we spoke about the different types of interview that we have as well. If you can understand these key concepts and make sure that you understand each one of these individual things, particularly the different types of non-experimental methods, then we'll be off to a winner. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much for listening. And I hope your psychology revision is going great. Look out for my next video coming soon, which will be on the other types of non-experimental methods. That's observation and case study. Until then, guys, take it easy and we'll see you next time. Cheers.